Good morning to all of you, and thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. The first question I have is what I'm doing here. <laughs> now, you know, there's a certain modest media-earning doctor who tried to warn me about hanging out with the types at Daily Maverick. And now this morning, I'm sorry that I haven't listened to him. <laughs> because being here with first keynote is a bit of a setup because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a deployment committee <laughs> comprising Rick, Ferial, Rebecca, and a few other people. And my standing here is the work of their deployment committee, and uh, I'm sure deployment committees are going to be one of the topics of the day. So, <clears throat> part of what I hope to be able to do, and it's not very hard given the anchors for the first panel, uh, Dennis and Karen, not hard, but I do want to provoke a discussion. Um, about the journey we are on to remake the interactions between ourselves and the transformation of our country. So I do want to start with a nostra culpa. My generation stands accused of walking away from an incomplete transition. Perhaps we considered the adoption of the Constitution was an end point, not fully realizing that rules need to be scribed and institutions built. Or perhaps it was just that the struggle had been too long and arduous and that we would resolve the incomplete business in the fullness of time. Or perhaps it was that youthful enthusiasm, we were raised on the diet of Marx and Lenin and our political education focused on the withering of the state so it would wither, we didn't have to bother too much about building this thing. <clears throat> Leaving too few texts for us actually on statecraft. Whatever the reason, we should, have, we should have an honest discussion about the aspects that remain undone. My contention is that it will never be too late for that discussion. Curiously, when we were assigned the task of convening the National Planning Commission, we saw it as an opportunity to re-energize the discussion about constitutional values some 14 years after the Constitution had been adopted. When we adopted the Constitution, we were very pleased that the preamble described us, who were there, as freely elected representatives, and set out a few basic tasks for these representatives of the people. But the Constitution does actually not set out what the duties of members of Parliament are. There are powers related to legislation, holding the executive organs of of state accountable and maintaining oversight of executive organs without defining precisely what it means. Probably the greatest deficiency of all is to define how MPs are meant to represent the interests of the people. What does the people shall govern actually mean in this context? And in respect of the objectives articulated in the preamble, such as healing the divisions of the past, laying the foundations for a democratic and open society where every citizen is protected equally by law, improve the quality of life of each citizen and build a united and democratic South Africa capable of taking its rightful place in the family of nations. <clears throat> what does any of this and all of it mean? With what instruments will these objectives be addressed? And how will citizens know that they are being done? Our idea of what <clears throat> the representative functions and duties of public representatives remains incomplete at best. It's very obvious to most when you look at uh, local government across the country, and local government's different because it's a split system of both proportional representation and uh, direct ward uh, uh, representatives but it remains unbelievably complex and difficult. You can look at even the idea of coalitions, and Kuruleni has been in the news very recently for all of the wrong reasons. So what does it mean to be a public representative? Or that individuals who happen to lead parties, even though they have 
very fancy titles about being commanders and so on, can summarily remove public representatives without recourse to anything. Surely that is not in the interests and the spirit of our Constitution. <clears throat> Perhaps in the drafting of our Constitution we were uh, we wore rose-tinted spectacles and, and, and naively believed that all heads of state would, would act like Madiba and that presidential prerogatives would be exercised with care and attention. And now we look at life and <clears throat> part of what we need to talk about in this next period are these immense areas of presidential prerogatives, which include the unfettered power to appoint cabinet and deputy ministers, too many of those, of course, the appointment of premiers, the appointment of heads of security agencies, and the appointment of our foreign representatives without query or oversight. It is this vast area of practice, consonant, it is this vast area of practice consonant with the spirit of our constitution, I ask. Now, we all appreciate that open-ended and protracted negotiations were obviously not in the interests of democracy. But should we not have returned to, the matters, to these matters later? Is it too late to amend the powers of the president, I ask? Early in the democracy, we applied our best endeavors of statecraft as we understood it to how a democratic government should exercise control over the organs of state. We were convinced that, each, that such control would be best established by allowing manage, managers control over their key resources, being people and finance. We passed the Public Services Act in 1994 and the Public Finance Management Act in 1999. The approach was focused on the disassembling of the highly centralized organs that had hitherto existed for what we understood to be the purpose of advancing the Bruderbund agenda. <clears throat> the Public Service Commission that made all public service appointments at whatever level in government and the Department of State expenditure, the Exchequer, that controlled all government expenditure and procurement through the State Tender Board. I have a sense that the greatest weaknesses of the state at present certainly as reflected by the Zondo Commission or Human Resource Management or Cater Deployment at its worst, and financial management with an emphasis on supply chain management. I should point out that various attempts were made to resolve these matters, but the efforts always tended to come up against the imperatives of the electoral cycle and marauding caucuses and were defer deferred for a later time. I could talk about the manifestations of these tendencies across many organs of state, across all three spheres of government. But let me specifically about, talk about the criminal justice sector to align with today, this morning's focus on crime and corruption. <clears throat> when we drafted the National Development Plan 12 years ago, we included a seven-point plan to strengthen the criminal justice system that has now seemingly been forgotten. By the way, the same proposals had been adopted by Cabinet uh, in 2007 at a time when the Scorpions, remember them? But the Scorpions still existed then. <clears throat> and these seven points are firstly to adopt a single vision and mission, including performance measurement targets for the criminal justice system, to establish through legislation about protocol, a new and realigned single coordinating management structure for the system, Thirdly, to make substantial changes to court processes in criminal matters. Fourthly, to put into operation priorities identified for the component parts of the system. Fifth, to establish an integrated and seamless information and technology database for the national criminal justice system. Sixth, to modernize in an integrated and holistic way all aspects of systems and equipment and seventh, to involve the public in the fight against crime by introducing changes to the community police forums. The document also detailed ways to professionalize the police service 
which included, importantly, the demilitarization of the police. None of these have been taken up. Unless, of course, your panels this morning would, would prove me wrong, but that's, that's the kind of debate that we must have as a country. Since the NDP was drafted, there have been significant advances in artificial intelligence and technology platforms, yet the SAPS has still not been able to introduce a digital biometric system. Other departments, including the notoriously challenged Department of Home Affairs, have done so. So for a task as uncomplicated as getting fingerprints, our police continues to use ink, rollers, and, and, and these metal pads just as they did a century ago. There's no application of voice recognition or any similar software, so an individual reporting a case has to sit before a poorly equipped police officer dictating a statement if they want to lay a charge. Can any person think of why this archaic method is still preferred by the police? The proposal to have digitalized, docket trans uh, di digitalized dockets transferring seamlessly between um, local and regional police, the prosecutorial service, the courts and correctional services is far too modern if that is what you want to believe. But more likely the reality is that if dockets are digital, they leave an electronic footprint and they cannot be sold. Yet we know that life is so advanced that, for example, when we make an online purchase, and it could be as basic as uh, uh, an inexpensive bit of food, you know what happens every step of the way. You know when your order has landed with a place that you'd like to provide the food. You know when it's being prepared, when it's being collected. You know where the driver of the scooter is. You can anticipate what time it's being delivered to your home, yet an entire police service cannot utilize the most elementary IT for the things they do. For a budget of 109.4 billion rand, South Africa employs 188,000 SAPS personnel. That's outside of municipal police. <clears throat> yet we have no idea of what they do every day, what progress has been made with particular investigations, who's arrived for work, or what the productive output is. Should taxpayers not know what functions these good people are employed to perform and what progress they're making? Interestingly, the estimates of national expenditure, that 1,094-page document released on Budget Day, also references the fact that there are 39,801 detectives Yet we are informed that each investigator carries about 100 case dockets at any point in time. What is the success rate of the investigations and prosecutions? Something clearly does not add up. Moreover, it is unclear what the anticipated focus of the police service is. When one looks at the scale of contact crimes, where or what does the SAPS do to educate and prevent the execution of these crimes? Uh, numbers released by Gauteng yesterday report the fact that in the third quarter in Gauteng, just Gauteng, there were 1,787 homicides. 1,787 in a three-month period in 2023. What does it speak to? in the context of prevention. And then you need to get into prosecution and the success of <clears throat> In fact, interestingly, the person who released uh, those stats uh, happens to be the commissioner of uh, police in Gauteng. Last week did an interview with a journalist where he described that he too had been the victim of crime. It was an interesting story. Um, he spoke about what he lost, two firearms, two iPhones, a Patek Philippe watch, 
Now, the laughter says that people know how much Patek Philippe watches cost. My hunch is that you couldn't afford it on a police person's salary. Why he had to tell that he lost a Patek Philippe watch, I don't know. But he felt sufficiently important to share that information. Now, if it wasn't a genuine Patek Philippe, then it must have been a counterfeit. That also is a crime. But the cherry on top of the commissioner's interview was the fact that the people who'd robbed him were apprehended by a private security company. <laughs> I rest. But we also need to ask what the SAPS has done to equip highly specialized units to arrest, uh, to arrest and prosecute the modern crimes such as cyber, sophisticated corruption, money laundering, high-end narcotics and narcotics uh, transshipment, uh, and, a, and a range of similarly innovatory cli uh, crimes of dishonesty that are so present in society. More well, basically, what strategies have been adopted to counter a range of specialized contact crimes? And I'm thinking of things like taxi violence, and assassins. We don't need a minister who boasts about working from home, thus avoiding the uninhabitable offices assigned to the police ministry. When the SAPS officials have no such luxury of working from home, we need a minister of police who will comply with section 206.1 of the Constitution, and be responsible for policing and for determining national police policy. Similarly, we do not need a police minister who stomps all over crime scenes conta contaminating evidence or pitches up selectively at high profile court cases, television cameras in tow. We need a minister who will be focused on improving the efficiency of the service and ensuring that the organization and deployment of personnel is optimal. We need a minister who will, collaboratively, will co collaborate closely with a group of competent managers to ensure that the, the letter and spirit of the Constitution and the South African Police Service Act is, is applied. I cannot understand how the police can hope to exercise their mandate with community relations as generally poor as it is and crime intelligence is decrepit as it's been since the destruction of the function by people like the erstwhile head, Richard Mbluli. Importantly, because the police service is as poor as it is in the discharge of its responsibilities, the criminal justice cluster cannot function. If the water is contaminated upstream, you can imagine that it's undrinkable by the time it gets down, and it's exactly the same in a pipeline of a service like the criminal justice cluster. <clears throat> the point raised earlier in the National Development Plan, and I say as adopted by an, an earlier cabinet, is to adopt a single vision and mission. It's now needed more than ever before. It's very difficult to deal with all the elements of the criminal justice cluster and ignore that the real value of an informed and uncorrupted intelligence service ought to play a, a role. I spend a large part of my life now in the insurance sector, and risk appraisal, risk mitigation, is what shapes an industry like that. And in a similar way, governments actually need to avoid risk, and intelligence services have a role to play. I know it's not popular, it's certainly not popular with many of you, but believe me, it's a necessary element if properly constructed. The proper construction is not going to come about through the uh, General Intelligence Laws uh, Amendment Bill, but it needs to be constructed. The country needs it. Turning then to the NPA, and here I'm on very thin ground because, you know, Glynis and, and Anton are going to have me for breakfast on this issue. <clears throat> I want to assert that the NPA was hollowed out or white anted during the tenure of people like Sean Abrams, Ngobo Jiba, and Lawrence Mkwebe. Thank heavens for the work of the investigating directorate, 
But to be successful, the NPA has to operate across a much broader spectrum than those reported to the ID. As indicated earlier, the skills within the NPA must be speedily rebuilt. As the NPA's Deputy, Deputy National Commissioner, Anton Duplessis, who is here with us today, wrote with Martin Schontech uh, in, the, in the DM yesterday, methodically rebuilding the NPA is crucial. They point out that at its inception in 1998, the NPA rapidly established itself as a world-class prosecution service, but its efficacy was undermined by nearly a decade of state capture. <clears throat> Today, the task of rebuilding has to focus not only on the NPA or even the SAPS, <clears throat> but also in the number of supporting agencies. Occasionally, we lose sight of just how interconnected the various parts of, the crime, of crime prevention are. <clears throat> An article earlier this week uh, referenced a certain Mr. Poala, an erstwhile employee of financial surveillance at the Reserve Bank. He's now in private practice. <clears throat> but he... Uh, seems to have a love for horse racing and golf. And there's a certain person of amazing repute, sometimes in Stellenbosch, other times in Hermanus, I forget his name, <laughs> who supplied tips, and in exchange for the tips, it's been almost impossible to prosecute Steinel for what they've done. So <coughs> it's not just the institution. <coughs> it's also the ability to know what individuals and institutions are doing at any given time. The South African Revenue Service also has a set of responsibilities relating to the rooting out of crime. Granted, even there, there are some systems, such as the tax clearance certificates, which were introduced uh, in about 1998, that are already very dated. I'm sure that uh, SARS is rebuilding after its hollowing out during the state capture years, and this was the subject of a speech at UNISA last night by uh, erstwhile President Thabo Mbeki. They may be making reasonable progress, but the gaps still appear in the system. I also want to reference the, home, the Department of Home Affairs into this discussion. Just pause and consider the advantages of a single national identity, uh, identity system and what it would offer, such as the Aadhaar system uh, in India, which has issued 1.3 billion identity cards. The card contains details such as addresses, email addresses, mobile numbers, and tax status. The same card will be used to receive grants, pay taxes, receive tax refunds, etc. The same system will also record which tenders have been awarded. The system is smart enough to outfox the ten entrepreneurs and return the country to clean administration. So what are we waiting on? If India can do it for 1.3 billion people, what is it about us that we can't do for 63 million people? That's the question that confronts us. The Financial Intelligence Center similarly has a significant role to play. When the FIC Act was first conceived of, the idea was that whilst the FIC could not actually uh, investigate crimes, it would need to close out the avenues where corrupt monies, laundered monies, and the proceeds of crime would generally find resonance. People who behave like that need to show they need to show in the houses they purchase, they need to show in the cars they drive, they need to show in the flash of jewelry and clothing. They need to show, and so close that out, and they won't actually know what to do with the money. On top of it, there are other basic systems that can be applied. If Trevor Manuel receives a salary every month and never needs to draw on his salary, there's something wrong in the equation. So why should these things be that hard? Why have we created mechanisms that make it so difficult to actually get at the wrongdoing and at the same time support people who try and improve and, and want to do good things? There are also issues in the act. Uh, there's the inappropriately named 
Money Laundering Advisory Council. I keep thinking we should have said Anti-Money Laundering Advisory Council, but, but yeah. it's there, but either way, it doesn't operate at present. You need to get the agencies, you need to get the estate agents, you need to get the car dealers, you need to find out who's buying all of these expensive multi-million rand cars with what resources. You need to establish those kinds of facts. You need accountability in the, in, 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 in the system and you need to hold people who are licensed to exercise or provide those services to account for what they do. We need to know what the um, casinos are doing at any given time. We, we need to know and we can know and we must ensure that an institution like the FIC be jacked up to be able to get there. We also need a discourse about the amount of cash in the system. In a recent press report, an individual, a tentrepreneur, she admitted, went into the branch of a bank and on one day drew 250,000 rand, put it in a, in a, in a very fancy handbag and allegedly handed this to a minister. And on another day went to a different branch of the same bank uh, and drew 200,000 rand, same modus operandi, packed the 200,000 rand in a wonderful handbag, delivered it to the home of the minister, she claims. Now, for what good reason would people need to draw those sums of money? Sure, business people need to sometimes do payroll, but then you apply. You apply and, and, and do the exceptions. But the idea that people can walk into banks and draw all of this money that nobody knows what will be used for is fundamentally a problem in our system. I know in the US you couldn't draw anything more than $10,000 without inviting interest of the services. There's no reason why we shouldn't do exactly the same here. Let me finally turn to the courts. The ice gets thinner, you will notice, because Dennis is going to bollock me in a moment. I want to repeat that the courts cannot perform miracles if the institutions upstream are incapable. Whilst we have an ongoing obligation to ensure that all are equal before the law and that each has the right to equal protection and benefit of the law, there have to be limits applied, I suggest. We know that the costs of Impeaching John Flope were approximately 10 million rand. And that the former public protector, now a member of parliament, Pusi Siwe Mkwebani, notched up legal costs of 30 million rand. I cannot even calculate on both sides, his and those of the state, that former President Jacob Zuma has cost the taxpayers in legal fees. Also in particular, high profile cases, such as the Senzo Moiwa trial, a staggering amount of time, money and effort has been consumed, especially or because of the investigations appear to have been botched from the very beginning. There's no interest in resolving the case. The judge can get frustrated, but the lawyers supplied by legal aid have no interest in concluding the matter because for as long as they're in court, there's a flow of money. The prosecutions don't have any time limits on what they're doing. There is a fundamental problem in the way in which our system runs. Let me conclude. My general submission is that our revolution was horribly disrupted. I referred earlier to our political textbooks. I spoke about Lenin on the withering of the state. There's another interesting text, uh, Rick would be interested in this. Uh, uh, Karl Marx spoke about the revolution in permanence. Now part of our problem is we just guillotined the process and thought it's all over, but we need a sense of permanence. We need to bring back these issues. We need to open the debate. We need to look at our constitution. We need to own it sufficiently to improve on 
the efficacy of its performance. We need to measure the changes in our lives. That's a challenge of the moment. What we need now is to recognize that the rupture of the Zuma and Ramaphosa years, it's a link I'm providing provocatively, cannot be interpreted, interpreted to require of us to give up on the very fine values that bind us as a nation and are articulated in our constitution. Part of the message here is that we identify what is wrong and convene across political lines to seek remedies. With the best will in the world, and you're going to hear a lot about these things today, and I am looking for more and more trouble. With the best will in the world, these matters will not be addressed by a new parliament, however constituted from June. We need to debate with, but also beyond political parties. I think I know a thing or two more about parliament than I know about the subjects I've been talking about this morning. After all, I spent 20 years of my life in that place. I'm saying we need a movement, a discussion, a discourse. A clear institution that can debate these matters way beyond the powers and responsibilities of political parties. Thank you very much.